All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Wilson. I am the Ag Weather and Climate Field Specialist with OSU Extension. Uh, and on behalf of my co-host, Amanda Doritas, uh, and the Agronomics Crops Team's uh, Weather Extremes Committee, I want to welcome you uh, to this first installment of our 2023 Climate and Webinar Series. So uh, the goal of this series is really to provide you with information concerning, um, you know, a hot ag topic, kind of pun intended there, uh, where weather and climate, of course, play, play a big role. And so we will feature uh, in this series a guest speaker for uh, each topic and then present some information on uh, recent climate and, and tools uh, that you can explore then uh, on your own uh, beyond the presentation if you wish. Uh, so today's topic is uh, climate and disease management, and we have with us Dr. Pierce Paul. Uh, Dr. Paul, who I believe many of you probably know and have heard, uh, is Professor and Associate Chair of Cereal Pathology in the Department of Plant Pathology uh, in CFACE, the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences at the Worcester campus uh, for Ohio State University. Uh, Dr. Paul, thank you for joining us today. All right. Uh, thank you, Aaron. And uh... Thanks, Amanda, and the committee for organizing this seminar series. Um, really, really happy to be here and share some of the work we've been doing, specifically looking at how weather variables can be used to predict vomitoxin in corn. I know this is a very hot topic. We had uh, more problems, more issues with vomitoxin again in 2022, and the questions keep coming in. Um, I want to just apologize up front. Some aspects of this is a little bit more technical in terms of some of the details, uh, because this is pulling directly from some of the work done by my PhD student. But hopefully, um, it's enough for you to grasp uh, what I want to share with you today in terms of how challenging it is to try to associate weather with um, vomitoxin and corn. So, um, All right, so uh, before we get, get into talking about vomitoxin, I really wanna stick a pin here and, and hopefully this is the first take home message you guys are gonna have from this presentation that vomitoxin does not exist by itself. I think there's a little bit of a misconception out there where folks tend to think that vomitoxin infects corn or vomitoxin increase in crop residue or vomitoxin. Vomitoxin does not exist on its own. Vomitoxin is associated with a fungal infection of the corn plant. And when that infection occurs, specifically infection of the air, it causes gibrella air rot. So gibrella air rot and vomitoxin go hand in hand. Typical symptoms of gibrella air rot would be this pinkish discoloration of the tip of the ears. And this happens because the fungus infects via the silk channel. And once the fungus penetrates the silks, silks and get down in there, it colonizes the um, those kernels. And the only way it's capable of colonizing the kernel is because the fungus produce vomitoxin. So as the fungus spreads, and by the way, I'm going to use the word vomitoxin and don or dioxin evolinol interchangeably here because we are referring to the same thing. Don is the technically correct name. Vomitoxin is the name that's commonly used. But in order, to the fung in order for the fungus to grow and colonize the corn ear, it has to produce vomitoxin. Without vomitoxin, it infects, but it stays in one place. So the disease and the toxin go hand in hand. The more disease you've got, the more vomitoxin you have. Now you could have situations where the fungus infects, conditions are not right for visual symptoms of the disease to develop, but the fungus can still produce vomitoxin once it's growing in there. So you have situations where you might have relatively low levels of visual symptoms of the disease, but still vomitoxin one or two parts per million. So just, in, just important to stick the pin here in terms of making it clear that the toxin is associated, intimately associated with infection by the fungus, and in most cases with visual symptoms of the disease. Consequences of this disease is not new to anybody who's listening here, I'm sure. It causes um, grain yield and quality reduction, yield reduction and test weight. This is because once the fungus infects, it pulls the nutrients out of those kernels that are infected, resulting in small lightweight kernels, which reduce yield, reduce test weight as well. Those kernels are also contaminated with mycotoxins. Vomitoxin is the one we're most concerned about, but the fungus can produce other toxins that, are, that can cause other detrimental health effects. 
but vomit toxin is the one we often focus on because it's probably the most frequently occurring. And it's the one that we track and we monitor for and grain, grain quality and grain price discounts and grain rejection are all associated with, with vomit toxin. It's a problem in the livestock industry as well because swine are very sensitive. Hence, some of the restrictions set by um, um, grain elevators in terms of rejecting loads or pricing down loads or um, when vomitoxin levels are above certain thresholds. So there's lots and lots of major consequences and lots and lots of justification for wanting to um, quantify or predict the risk of vomitoxin contamination. It's also a concern in the ethanol industry. When vomitoxin levels are high in the grain, then it, increase, it increases threefold in the DDGs, which are often used as animal feed. So there are lots and lots of consequences across the corn production industry that makes it important for us to study and better understand how weather affects this disease and how weather can be used to predict um, vomitoxin in the grain. A quick look at the disease cycle. If you've seen my presentations before, you, I'm sure you've seen this slide before. This is basically saying the fungus that causes this disease is all over the place. We produce corn, wheat, and soybean. The same fungus causes head scab in wheat. It causes stock rot and ear rot in corn, and it causes seedling diseases in all tree crops. So Fusarium gruminearum is all over the place. It's part of our cropping system because uh, lots of fields are planted into no-till or reduced till or some form of conservation tillage, lots of crop residue left in the field. This fungus survives the residue in the field. So once conditions are right, spores are gonna spread from residue to the wheat spike causing head scab or to the corn ears causing um, a rot, and you're gonna have problems with vomitoxin. So our production system is one that favors this fungus and consequently the diseases um, the diseases it causes. And, you know, therefore we need to come up with strategies to help manage and to help predict consequences of this disease. So, you know, when you think about weather and disease, I wanna take you back to basics a little bit. Disease triangle, you've all seen this before, I'm sure, from my presentations, Dr. Dorrance's presentation in past, Horacio's presentation as well. We pathologists always talk about disease triangle. For you to have disease and how much disease you have in the field, you must have these three pieces of the triangle. Favorable weather conditions, a host that's susceptible at the right growth stage, pathogen that's aggressive and capable of causing disease, and in the case of mycotoxin, producing toxin. This is pretty basic. You must have these conditions. And how, depending on how much of these conditions you have or how favorable these conditions you have or how well they line up, it, it depends on how much disease you end up having. So basically, it's an interaction between host, environment, and the pathogen to give you disease. And when you add mycotoxin or vomitoxin in this case to the, um, to the picture, you've got a disease, a triangle, a mycotoxin production triangle as well. The same set of factors where the conditions affect mycotoxin production, host susceptibility affect mycotoxin production, and pathogen mycotoxin producing ability affect mycotoxin production. You may be wondering why the triangles are not overlapping perfectly. This is simply because even though the same set of weather conditions affect disease development, Jabrella ARAT in this case, and mycotoxin production, vomitoxin in this case, there are subtle differences in terms of weather conditions, the host and the pathogen that affect the disease differently from the way they affect um, mycotoxin production. One example, temperatures, relative humidity, and rainfall may cause Gibrella ARAT development. But even after symptoms develop, symptoms develop up to a certain point, that fungus can still grow without additional symptom development be, in response to temperature rainfall towards the end of the season, leading to higher levels of amitoxin. So that's one example where, okay, weather favors disease development, but even after disease stops developing, that fungus can still infect those kernels and produce mycotoxin, depending on weather towards the end of the season. The same can be said for the host. A host may be resistant to the disease, in other words, relatively low visual symptoms of the disease, but not resistant to the toxin. So you can have fairly high levels of toxin, even though you've got relatively low level of disease. And the opposite is also true. 
you can have fairly high levels of disease with relatively low levels of toxin. We've done some work looking at some of the hybrids in the corn performance trial, and we see the full range of reaction. Some hybrids with relatively high levels of disease and low levels of toxin, and then some high hybrids with very relatively low levels of disease and high levels of toxin. So, you know, that's why the disease triangles are very similar. Similar conditions drive the disease, similar conditions drive the toxins, but then there are some differences based on whether the host and the pathogen. And by the way, um, Aaron and, and Amanda, I am pretty comfortable with people asking questions during my presentation. So if there's anything in the chat box and you guys want to um, you know, stop me and ask that question, please feel free. F fine if you want to wait until the end, but I'm pretty comfortable with, I like interacting with the group. With the group. So if people want to ask questions during my presentation, that's fine as well. Okay. So uh, again, another aspect of weather that affects this disease um, is uh, dry dung, air dry dung position, um, air position during dry dung. This is a function of hybrid reaction, function of environmental conditions, function of agronomics as well. And typically, like I said before, the disease develop towards the tip of the ear, as you can see here with my mouse. But then when the ears dry down in an upright position, you can have the disease developing at the base of the ear as well. And this is closely linked to weather conditions as well. When you've got ears drying down in an upright position, water collects to the base of the ear, and then infection can take place at the base of the ear and spread upwards. Typically, it, it, uh, infection takes place via the silk channel and grows downward. But then if those ears towards the end of the season, when you've got wet conditions, those ears dry down in an upright position, they can infect, it can infect and grow upwards. So here again, another impact of weather on what you see in terms of air rat development and mycotoxin contamination. And here's a quick look at some data from um, some field experiments that were done last year. I want to acknowledge my colleague at Beck for providing, helping us to provide, providing, sharing this data with us. And basically, this, uh, this is not about the fungicide treatment we tested, but this is just to show the effect of air dry down position on vomitoxin in, in corn. So you've got one, two, three, four, five different scenarios. Uh, and in four of the five scenarios, ears that dry down in a turned down position had low levels of amitoxin than ears that dry down in an upright position. This is same hybrid planted in the same field. What they did is walk those fields, collect 20 ears that dry down in a turn down position, 20 ears that dry down in a turn up position, send me those ears, we shell them, ground them, and then they were tested for vomitoxin. And in four of the six cases, you had lower levels of vomitoxin in the ears that dry down in a turn down position compared to the ears that dry down in an upright position, clearly showing the association between um, air position and vomitoxin contamination of grain. And this is linked somewhat to weather conditions, like I said before. So typically when you think about weather and vomitoxin contamination or weather and diseases in general, some very crude summaries of weather of, um, are often used as measures to, to determine association. Average conditions, for example, people look at the season and said, this was an average growing season in terms of rainfall, in terms of temperature, relative humidity. They look at totals, total amount of rainfall or minimum and maximum, minimum temperature, maximum temperature, minimum relative humidity. And for most, for most things, these are decent summaries to provide decent estimates of what's happening in the field in terms of disease development, in terms of yield, in terms of amitoxin contamination. But these are not often the best summaries of weather variables to predict or to quantify vomitoxin in corn. Quite often, not only the average matters, but when are you looking at the average? Average during what time of the growing season? How many days of temperature, maximum temperature you had? How many of days of temperatures within a certain range you've got? How many hours of days of temperature above a certain minimum you've got? And rainfall intensity, for example, number amount of rainfall per unit time. These are different forms of representing these same weather summaries, averages, totals, minimum and maximum, that tells you a little bit more about vomitoxin contamination of grain. I'll share you some slides for you in a little bit. 
but it's important to point out when we do this type of research, we try to find some finer resolution in terms of the weather data to get a sense for which form or what type of weather data is tied to the disease. Totals, averages, maximum or minimum do not always um, cut it in terms of giving you information to predict, to develop risk assessment models or prediction models for my toxin in corn, for example. So let's let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I'm gonna ask if there's any questions now. I can I'd be happy to take a couple of questions on on vomitoxin, on Gibrella Airat and vomitoxin before I go on to the forecasting models. Here so far there was a question about ear position. I think uh, that was covered. We just have one about tar spot if you want to wait till the end. Beautiful. I'll talk tar spot and whatever else at the end. All right, okay. so let's get into some risk assessment models. So the idea is vomitoxin. And, and the obvious question is, why do you want to predict the risk of vomitoxin? Well, you know, if we know that vomitoxin is likely to be a problem, then it can help us make decisions as to whether I should get grain tested. Should I scout fields for ears to see if how much air rod I've got? These are all activities that cost money. Should I harvest my grain early? Should I adjust my combine to get rid of some of those moldy grain? So it allows you to make very key management decision from a farmer standpoint. From a grain buyer standpoint, it helps you to decide, um, should I test? Should I source grain from a certain region? So these are all important um, justifications or important applications of forecasting systems for uh, vomitoxin. So what we did uh, several uh, Four years in a row, we collected data. This is work done by one of my PhD students from about 40 different environments, planted with multiple hybrids. These are the locations of the corn performance trials. And then we collected data using local weather station. And yes, there's other sources of data that Aaron is going to talk about that can be used for uh, developing these same models. And one of the things we want to do is to test these models that we develop. I'll share some models at the end. These models that we develop using weather data from other sources. But what we did, we collect on-site weather information, and then we summarize that weather information collect vomitoxin information from these locations, from 15 hybrids at each of the 10 locations. And then we look at the relationship between weather variables and vomitoxin contamination. So we collect those samples and you can see here my crew shell the grain, grind it and test it for vomitoxin. And then once we had the vomitoxin, we had to generate summary weather variables to predict, to see which variables show the strongest correlation with vomitoxin contamination. So we use R1, the silky growth stage, as our reference growth stage. And then we collected weather variables and summarized them for periods before R1, for periods after R1. And again, this is important because that's when the infection takes place. That's when the fungus lands on the silk. So we argue that, OK, if this is when the fungus lands on the silk, then it requires the ideal or the best set of environmental conditions for the fungus to penetrate the silk, to grow, excuse me, to grow down the silk, to colonize the kernels. So let's look at weather conditions before and after silking to determine which combinations of conditions favor vomitoxin contamination of grain. It's also important to look at weather conditions before silking, because if you want to make a fungicide application and you want to use a risk assessment model or a forecasting model to make a fungicide application decision, then it's important to have information before silking and see how that information correlates with vomitoxin contamination so that you can use that information to make a fungicide application decision. And we've developed models using pre-silking data as well, and I'll share that towards the end of my presentation. So then we summarize the data. We ask the question, is five days of data sufficient to predict vomitoxin? Five days before, five days after silking, or 10 days or 15 days. So we did a full range of um, summaries, summarizing weather variables, five days, 10 days, 15 days, 25, 30 days. And then we ask the question, which form of weather variables and which form of weather variable summary provides the best correlation with vomitoxin contamination. So we looked at averages. We looked at number of hours of temperature within a certain range, number of hours of relative humidity above a certain level. We looked at nighttime temperature, daytime temperature. So this is the technical part I'm talking about. This is an exercise in mining data. So we just had a series 
piece of weather information. We break this information up in all types of variables representing different windows before and after silking. And then we ask the question, is average temperature five days before silking strongly correlated with vomitoxin in the grain? Is 15 days of temperature above a certain minimum strongly correlated with vomitoxin in the grain? So we ask these questions using a series of, of computer models to help us um, generate summary of correlations between different weather variables and vomitoxin contamination. So here's one look, one example. Here's another technical graph. I'll try to explain it a little bit to make it less painful. But you've got a graph here showing um, summaries over five days, 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, 25, and 30 days. And if you look, the general trend is the same, regardless of whether you summarize the data over five days or 30 days. We look at the summaries relative to R1, so this dark line down the middle, the uh, vertical line is the R1 growth stage. And if you look at the data closely, um, five-day summary is more erratic, is very inconsistent across um, the period after R1, but then the 15-day summary is fairly consistent and shows the, some of the highest correlations um, with vomitoxin. So on the left, on the y-axis, you've got correlation. A correlation of one is perfect relationship between the weather variable you're looking at and vomitoxin. Correlation uh, 0.5 is very acceptable for this type of disease. And if you look closely at about 15 days, 15 days of weather summary after, um, after R1, you had some of the strongest correlation with data summarized over 15 days. So what we learned from this is, yes, it matters whether you look at only five days of data or 10 days of data or 15 days of data to determine which data shows the strongest correlation with vomitoxin. And we concluded from this work that 15 days of, in this case, relative humidity, average relative humidity, 15 days of average relative humidity um, summarized after R1 or after silking provided some of the strongest correlation with vomitoxin contamination of the grain. So we then looked at um, when. So I think it's important. Well, I mentioned before, we typically look at averages, maximum, minimum, throughout the growing season or uh, throughout the month of January or February. But sometimes these averages do not tell the whole story. So the important question is, ask, is asking, when do I look at my weather variables? When do I summarize weather variables to get a, bet, a better sense of how favorable conditions are for vomitoxin contamination of the grain? So again, this is average relative humidity. And if I look at 15, between 15 and 20 days after silking, that's when this weather variable had the strongest correlation with vomitoxin. If you look at about seven days after uh, R1, you find almost no correlation or very low correlation. So it depends on where you look and when you look, which weather variable you're looking at. And if you're looking at relative humidity, some of the strongest positive correlation with vomitoxin contamination of the grain occurs when you've got uh, at about 15 to 20 days after silking. Some of the strongest negative correlation occurred at about seven days um, before R1. And this is important. So if we're developing models to predict vomitoxin to make a fungicide application, then we want to use models that use weather summaries before R1 so you can have a prediction made before R1 and you can say, okay, under these conditions, the risk of vomitoxin contamination of the grain is high or low, and you should make a fungicide application based on the risk. The other question we typically ask when we summarize weather variable, weather variables is what form of weather summary? Is average relative humidity the best way of summarizing the weather variable? Is minimum relative humidity is the best way of summarizing the weather variable? Or is maximum re relative humidity the best way of summarizing the variable? Again, if you look at this graph, it's pretty much the same graph that I showed before. Some of the highest correlations between average relative humidity and <clears throat> and vomitoxin occurred between that 15 and 21 days after uh, R1. Some of the highest negative correlation occurred at about that seven days after R1. When we looked at minimum relative humidity, pretty much similar trends, just about 
very similar pattern here in terms of the peaks in the correlation between minimum relative humidity and vomit toxin contamination. In other words, the higher the minimum relative humidity at 15 to 21 days after R1, the higher the level of vomit toxin. Similarly, the higher the average uh, relative humidity during the 15 and 20 days after R1, the higher the level of amitoxin contamination. However, when we use maximum relative humidity as a way of summarizing the variable, the um, summarizing relative humidity, the, the relationship between vomitoxin and relative humidity decreases considerably. The correlations are much lower when you use maximum relative humidity. I think the point here is to, is, to, is to emphasize that it depends on how you look at these weather variables in terms of making predictions, making an assessment of the association between weather variables. The same thing can be said for temperature. The same thing can be said for rainfall. It depends on when you look at the temperature conditions, before silking, after silking, how far before silking, how far after silking, whether you look at rainfall in terms of total amount of rainfall or rainfall duration or rainfall intensity, these are all variables that tell us something different. Once we collect these same, these same sets of variables, we summarize them in more than 300 different combinations and look at the ones that had the strongest correlation. And sure enough, it depends on how you look at rainfall, how you look at relative humidity, how you look at temperature, what time relative to R1 give you the strongest or the weakest correlation with vomitoxin in the grain. So uh, to develop our risk assessment tool, we did the same thing, and we found that uh, conditions between 7 and 21 days after R1 provided some of the strongest correlation with vomitoxin and were used as some of the strongest predictors of vomitoxin contamination. Yes, conditions before R1 were useful as well, but some of the strongest correlations we found were between um, seven and 21 days after R1. And there's a biological explanation for that. I'm not gonna spend too much time explaining that because the fungus does not need vomitoxin to increase, to infect the ears. It does not need vomitoxin to infect the silks. But once it gets in the silks, it needs vomitoxin to spread in the grain. And spread in the grain typically occurs after silking during grain fill. So seven to 21 days after R1 makes perfect sense because that's when the fungus is growing in those airs. That's when it needs the ideal conditions to spread vomitoxin. That's when it needs the ideal conditions to produce vomitoxin. And that's pretty much what we're seeing here, seven to 21 days after R1. The variable that we found to be one of the most strongly correlated is a variable representing combinations of temperatures between 59 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit and relative humidity greater than 80. So when you've got relatively humid conditions, greater than 80% relative humidity, and relatively warm conditions between 50, 59 and 86 um, degrees Fahrenheit, that's when we found some of the strongest correlations or strongest relationship with vomitoxin in the grain. Another variable, a simpler variable that um, worked very well as well, is when we've got relative humidity greater than 90, and temperatures greater than 68. So these are some very key um, weather variables, key weather thresholds that we found to be strongly correlated with vomitoxin and give us the strongest predictive ability to determine, okay, whether the risk of vomitoxin is high or low. So using these models, again, I'm gonna pause a little bit here to see if there are, there are questions. Uh, nothing in the Q&A yet. Beautiful. So using these weather summaries, we develop prediction models. And I've got a black box there because I don't want to show you guys any model equations. But typically, you establish a relationship between these weather variables and vomitoxin, run some statistical models on them, and you come up with an equation that describes the relationship between weather variables and vomitoxin contamination of the grain. And what the model does, it spits out a probability, or what we call a chance of vomitoxin being greater than one part per million. And I'll talk about that one part per million in a little bit. It gives you the probability of that field or that location based on the weather conditions having vomitoxin levels greater than one part per million. And you can convert, we convert that prediction, that probability in risk levels, where we say green is low risk, yellow is moderate risk, red, is high risk. 
and it's up it's up to the user the model doesn't give you these risk predictions it's up to the user your level of comfort in terms of what you consider to be high risk low risk or moderate risk we consider um, less than 24 percent chance of amitoxin contamination of the grain to be low risk between 25 and 49 percent chance of contamination uh, vomitoxin contamination to be moderate risk and greater than 50% chance to be high risk. And what we want to do with this information, create a tool that gives you these color patterns, and you can use that information to say, okay, vomitoxin risk is high, I should apply a fungicide, or vomitoxin risk is low, I should not worry about testing grain, or I should harvest, allow the grain to dry down in the field and harvest in the field. So these are all critical for important practical decision making. So we develop models and we've had models, um, more than, more than uh, about 11 different models predicting vomitoxin levels greater than one part per million. And those models perform with an accuracy of about 80, um, 80%. Here's a, here are a few examples of those models. This model here was developed using weather data collected between seven and 14 days before R1. So this is a model that can be used to make decisions about fungicide application. And red show high risk, blue show, shows low risk, and then in between is moderate risk. So high risk means that you've got greater than an 80%, between 60, um, greater than 60% chance of having vomitoxin levels be greater than one part per million in the grain. Blue means you've got less than a 40% um, chance of vomitoxin contamination of the grain. The uh, circles and the diamonds show actual data. So the color patterns here, the heat map, what we call it, we typically call this a heat map, shows predictions from the models. And then the diamond and the circle show actual data collected on the field and overlaid on these models. So it clearly shows that the diamonds are when you got samples with less than one part per million vomitoxin. It should fall in the blue area, and that's exactly what happens. When you have samples, the circles, with greater than one part per million vomitoxin, it should fall in the red area. And that's what happened in the most cases. Obviously, you've got some, some cases where there were mis misclassification, but those, those cases were relatively few. And what we use in this pre-R1 model is the sequence number of instances where you've got six or more hours with relative humidity greater than 80. So it's a fairly complex variable. And that's why when we develop these models, we really don't ask farmers or, or um, crop advisors to pull out their calculators and use it. It's not always easy to use these models just by pulling out calculators. We create apps and you can use these apps. All you need to do is enter your silking date, your field location, GPS coordinates, and it's gonna pull weather data and summarize the weather data in the way that we ask the app to summarize it to give you a prediction of amitoxin. So this is a fairly complex variable, sequence of six or more hours with relative humidity greater than 80%. On the left, on the uh, x-axis, you've got hours of temperature between 20 and 30 degrees for, um, Celsius in this case, um, as predictor of amitoxin contamination. So when you've got combination of few hours within this range and relative humidity within this range, that's when you've got the highest prediction of vomitoxin when you use data before silking. Pierce, we had a question and yep, I think go you, ahead. you're kind of uh, delineating it here. Uh, the question was about that equation, you know, relative humidity above 90, temperature above 68. They were asking if these variables are 24 hour averages. It's actually hourly counts where you meet right, those Exactly, right. hourly counts over a 15 day window. So we typically use the window between seven and 21 days or the window between seven and 21 days before R1 or seven and 21 days after R1. And then we count total number of hours in that window with temperature above a certain minimum or relative humidity above a certain minimum? That's a very, very good question. Again, once we put these models out, we're gonna have handouts explaining what they do. And my hope is that you don't have to pull out your calculator to use these. We wanna give you these, all you need to do, and just like you do with the SCAP forecasting system, enter your silking date, enter your field location, and hopefully the model gives you a prediction that you're willing to work with. Good question. Here's another graph. I got a couple more graphs before I finish up. Um, here is a post R1 prediction model. 
in other words, predict inflammatory toxin after R1. And this is useful for making grain handling decision, grain harvesting decision, and same general trend. Here you've got hours of temperature greater than 20 degrees for um, Celsius. Sorry, I, I, this is scientific publication. They want us to put this information in Celsius. And then hours of relative humidity greater than 90%. And the more hours of relative humidity, humidity greater than 90% and the higher number of hours of temperature greater than 20, the strongest correlation you've got, the highest, highest the risk of vomitoxin contamination. So this area here shows you relative humidity is fairly high, temperatures greater than 20, then you've got the highest risk of vomitoxin contamination when you're looking at weather after R1. This is the prediction. And again, the dots in the circle shows you actual data. So we walk fields after we develop these models, collect grain samples, collect weather data, and then we said, okay, how well is the model performing? A grain circles should fall in the pinkish and red area. Diamonds should fall in the bluish area. And pretty much the accuracy is about 80, 82% when you use this particular model. One last example, we've got 11 of these. I'm not gonna show all of these models. Similar trend, slightly simpler weather variable, average daily relative humidity over that 15 day period. Um, minimum temperature over that 15 day period. And again, warmer the conditions, more humid the conditions, the higher the risk of vomitoxin. And here we've got our validation data. Diamond should be in blue and circle should be in pinkish red. And that's pretty much what's happening, about 80% accurate. Questions so far? All right, so let's continue and finish up here. So what are we doing with this data? We continue to test. So we've got my postdocs visiting fields across the state of Ohio, collecting samples from all these different locations. We're gonna test these models and see how well they perform um, once we validate them on an independent data set. It's easy to, to see models doing 80% accurate. We use the same data set that was used to build the models. We really wanna test these models using an independent new data set from different locations, different years to see how robust the model is to changes in um, location and year. And to accurately predict vomitoxin, you can't do any good job of predicting vomitoxin if you don't go do a good job of sampling. So one of my postdocs is doing some sampling work to say, okay, when we do put these models out, we want to provide guidance as to how to best sample for vomitoxin so you can validate these models and see whether these models are working well or not. You may say the model is not working properly, not because the model is not doing well, because you do a poor job of sampling. We know vomitoxin is highly variable in the field, highly variable in the wagons and in and, and the grain bin. So we're doing some sampling work as well to see how well we can recommend sampling to go along with these models when we put them out there. So quick summary, models can be used for fungicide application to decide whether or not to scout fields, to decide grain cleaning, grain screening strategies, um, mycotoxin testing, and for handling and storage. A couple of quick slides on um, fungicide application for uh, Gibrella ARAT control. Um, the two best fungicides, because you want to predict disease to make a fungicide application decision. The two best fungicides um, that we've seen from our work is Merivis Neo and Proline, but these have to be applied at that silking growth stage. You want to choose the correct fungicide, apply the fungicide at the right growth stage, Hence, you know, the value again of using a, a forecasting system. If this disease is the one of concern, then you really want to choose the fungicide. These fungicides pretty much work well on most major diseases. But if you're going to use um, a fungicide that's specific for ARAT, you're going to use an application method that's specific for ARAT, then it's useful to have a tool to tell you that ARAT is a concern and you should prioritize your management program in terms of using the right product and the right application method. It's important to get the fungicide on at the silking growth stage. And here is why silking provides the best reduction in vomitoxin. If that fungicide is applied at that R1 growth stage, full silking, lowest level of vomitoxin in the green, that's the green bar. If you apply it later, five days after, 11 days after, vomitoxin levels end up being higher 
than if you apply that fungicide. So timing is critical. And again, timing decision for air rat management would benefit from having a tool like a forecasting system, weather-based forecasting system to help you make that decision. Some more data <coughs> showing the same thing. The blue bar shows proline. The best results are seen when proline is applied at R1 compared to, R to five days after R1 or 10 days after R1. The percent control is much higher when you apply that fungicide early enough. Here's some more data showing pretty much the same thing, but I wanna stick a, point, a pin here. This is probably my last slide because I'm running out of time, is that uh, fungicides are effective, fairly effective when disease levels are moderate to low or vomitoxin levels are moderate to low. Here's one example where we looked at several different fungicides. Let's focus on proline here. This is um, PROT, prothioconazole, which is proline. No significant reduction in vomitoxin when vomitoxin levels are high. 18 part per million vomitoxin, vomitoxin levels are fairly high. So I really wanna stick a pin here, even if you're using a forecasting system to make a fungicide application decision, you really wanna not rely on fungicide alone to give you adequate vomitoxin reduction. You really wanna use an integrated management program because fungicides tend to give you the best results when it's supported by resistance, supported by residue management, for example, tillage or crop rotation. So when you have an integrated program that uses multiple strategies to reduce disease, reduce vomitoxin, then you see the best results with fungicides. Fungicides alone are not gonna control this disease, are not gonna prevent grain contamination mycotoxins. I just wanna acknowledge my student. He is the student who did most of the PhD work for the forecasting system. And um, for more information, feel free to contact me, use my contact information. The corn newsletter website is always an excellent source of information. And then the crop protection network is always a good place to find information on air rot and vomitoxin and diseases in corn and wheat in general. I'm gonna stop there, Aaron, and um, take questions. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Pierce. That was a, a great presentation. We do have several questions uh, concerning VOM and then one about tar spot. So okay. uh, can vomitoxin spread to uh, other fertilized kernels from unfertilized ovules at the ear tip? Yes, it can. Again, once the fungus grows, if you've got right conditions for that fungus to grow and spread, then vomitoxin is going to spread. Again, it doesn't spread by itself. If conditions are not right for the fungus to grow, then um, vomitoxin is not going to spread because the fungus, as the fungus grows, it produces um, vomitoxin ahead of the advancing fungal growth, ahead of the advancing mycelium. And if once it does that, then vomitoxin levels automatically increases. And that's why we recommend even in storage, cool, dry conditions. Cool, dry conditions has nothing to do directly with vomitoxin. Cool dry conditions has to do with conditions to prevent or minimize fungal growth. And if you prevent and minimize fungal growth, then you've got a less, the less lower risk of vomitoxin contamination. <clears throat> Sorry, good question. Yep. Uh, the next one, um, the question was besides ear orientation, other hybrid by vomitoxin correlations? Yeah, you know, there's lots of hybrids and that's why it's such a challenge sometimes to, to pin these things down because silking characteristics, um, some hybrids, um, silk remain viable for longer. Um, that's also an, an important hybrid trait that affects vomitoxin um, contamination or um, fungal infection and vomitoxin buildup. Husk tightness, this also plays a role. So these are all factors that are hybrid dependent, but they're also dependent on agronomics. Planting density can affect these factors as well. But yes, there are other high hybrid traits other than um, air position, such as husk tightness and silking characteristics that can, um, that can affect vomitoxin contamination. Some hybrids have what they call silk resistance. Fungus is, is harder for the fungus penetrate the silk compared um, the hybrids with less silk resistance. Good question. So the next question is, uh, do you feel we need to be considering uh, using drop nozzles with fungicide application to get coverage on the silk? That's an excellent question. Um, we're, we're doing some work, um, some of the work on small plot work I'm doing here at um, in Worcester and at South Charleston as well. Oh, sorry guys, my throat is 
is <laughs> is irritating me here. And um, I'm doing some work with Jason Harshu in Crawford's County as well. This is on farm trial, looking at draft novels. I'm not going to necessarily say it's an investment you need to make now until such time that we have enough data to show that one draft nozzle does give you advantage in terms of um, covering those ears and, and reducing vomitoxin. The data I showed from Canada, those graphs with the V-shape, they use drop nozzles and got the best results with the silking application. So they definitely use drop nozzles there. Um, we want to make sure though that if you're getting, if you're using drop nozzles for air rot control, you're not losing in terms of tar spot or um, other leaf disease control. So we're still collecting data on drop nozzles. What we've seen so far, very promising results. This seem to be the best approach to get good coverage of the ears. And so far, I don't see drop nozzles compromising leaf disease control. But let's finish the research before we make a, a blanket recommendation. Okay. So, the, uh, Pierce, there's four more questions in the chat. Are, are you willing to maybe answer those directly through the Q&A? I'd be happy to answer those directly through the quick q Awesome. And then we'll go ahead and we'll we'll move on. So, again, thank you, uh, Pierce, for that great presentation and those uh, uh, answering those questions there. We're going to kind of shift toward the climate piece now. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and transition here. You should be done there. I'll stop sharing. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Oops. There we go. Let's do this. Share screen. Pierce, can you tell me, are you seeing the, uh, the right screen or the presentation screen? I'm seeing the presentation screen. I'm seeing with <clears throat> the screen with me on it. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so, um, yeah, as part of this series, we're going to be exploring a little bit of the climate information as well. And, and certainly we, we saw uh, how much weather uh, can control, uh, certainly, or be a part of disease management. I, hopefully, part of part of what we're trying to do here is maybe give you some tools or give you some, some other ways of finding weather and climate information. We'll start broad and maybe get a little bit more specific in our upcoming webinar in February as well. But I, I first wanted to kind of um, go back and, and review 2022 from a climate perspective. Um, for those that were sort of feeling like we were uh, um, a lot of roller coaster here lately, that's uh, certainly the case. We'll see that in a second. But overall, temperatures were pretty average for 2022. So kind of looking back at your operations and disease and things that you saw, overall, last year was pretty typical from a long-term perspective of what we've seen over the last 30 years or so. Now, if we look at the um, uh, top 128 years of the last 128 years, it was the 26th warmest. So it's just indicative of, of the conditions that we're seeing out there being warmer than average, warmer than most of the 20th century, though about average compared to the last 30 years. Uh, seasonally, this is what it looked like across Ohio. So we saw warmer than average temperatures last winter across southern Ohio. Spring was fairly warm, though, as you'll see, uh, you know, we've had, we certainly had periods of cold uh, during our, our spring weather there. Uh, summer got off to a pretty hot start, but then pretty mild the rest of the July and August period. And then heading into the fall, we had a, a, a lot of ups and downs, a lot, highly variable conditions uh, in October, November. And of course, we know what happened right before Christmas as well uh, with uh, extreme uh, swings in temperatures that we saw. From a precipitation standpoint, overall, we saw between 30 and 50 inches of rainfall across the state. Uh, this year, central Ohio and, and eastern Ohio uh, really saw the surplus. You can see that in the middle there, anywhere from three to upwards of nine inches above average. Uh, northwest, northwestern Ohio were really the dry spots, especially as we got into the fall season. Uh, one of the driest falls that we've seen since uh, 1966, 64, in some regards across the northwest and western portions of the state. Uh, so uh, obviously that that led to, um, you know, some of the drought conditions that continue to linger, although uh, certainly improving. Uh, I wouldn't say that we're really into drought conditions right now uh, as the state is starting to moisten up here over the last several weeks. Overall, last year was the 47th wettest. Uh, so, you know, we've seen a lot of top 10 wettest over the last decade. This one was a bit drier, but still in that top half of the record in terms of the last 128 years. Again, you know, uh, the old Sesame Street, which one of these doesn't belong, which one of these is not like the other. As far as our seasonal rainfall went last year, wet winter, fairly wet spring for a lot of us. Uh, those that didn't get spring rain 
had some timely summertime rain that you can see there in the third graph. And then the very dry conditions that moved in in fall, again, very, um, you know, about 50%, 25% of normal rainfall. If it's going to happen, obviously fall might be a good season, so we get the harvest done and things like that, but a little bit difficult this year, obviously getting emergence on some of those covers and wheat. So that's kind of the, the season overall. Uh, as of last week, we were still sitting with a little bit of moderate drought conditions there. So thinking about heading into this upcoming year, um, you know, we, we're really seeing that erode. I think we're going to have plenty of soil moisture recharge uh, heading into the new planting season as well. And just an update on the timing of production. If you've seen my presentations, you know, we're keeping track of these uh, suitable field work days. Uh, April continued that downward trend of about five degree, uh, five days less of suitable field work conditions in April. Uh, but we had a pretty spectacular October with about 23 suitable field work days there. Uh, so kind of bucking that trend a little bit in terms of timing. So that's kind of the overall conditions that we, we saw here across uh, Ohio uh, in terms of, of the year in summary. What, I'm, what I want to do now is, is go to uh, the Midwestern Regional Climate Center, and I'm going to again share my screen. Uh, as kind of a tool or, or kind of a portal that I think uh, many folks will find handy um, and um, something, you know, we'll kind of start out basic here a little bit with what you can find and, and something that I think is easy, tangible. You don't have to sign up for any of this. Uh, we have a lot of information at climate.osu.edu, uh, climate.osu.edu, which is the state climatologist page, uh, but even more tools here with the Midwestern Regional Climate Center, uh, which is a NOAA-funded regional climate center, and it's currently housed uh, at Purdue University. So this is free and open to the public. Uh, the mrcc.purdue.edu is the, uh, um, uh, the URL here. So a lot of tools, and, and again, over the next... Uh, couple of uh, webinars here, part of this series, we'll, we'll kind of dive into some of these tools that I think many of you would like to use, but we're going to kind of start out with kind of some overview stuff. So if you go to the Midwest Climate Watch here, Midwest Climate Watch, uh, and again, doing a live demo like this, obviously a lot of mines and pitfalls, but we're, we're going to kind of get through it. But uh, I think a really important page for those that want to see a quick snapshot over different uh, different time periods here. So we've got uh, for instance, if we just wanted to look at station temperatures for the Midwest for a particular uh, day over the last seven days, this is what you'll you'll find. So you can click on Midwest station maximums. And so you can see across the state and across the region, uh, the, the current the last 24 hour high temperatures all the way back to the last seven days. Uh, as an example, I think what's really effective uh, on this page is looking at the weekly and monthly maps. So some of you really interested in, in those weekly and uh, uh, monthly conditions. Uh, so for instance, we can look at the last seven days, uh, temperature departure from mean conditions, right? Uh, so we'll pull this up, quite warm, right? We've had really for many cities across Ohio uh, for the month of month to date, we can go ahead and do that one too. Month to date here under temperature mean, uh, really pulling up these really quick uh, figures to show you um, a lot of the areas that you see in that dark pink or pinkish uh, across Ohio have had their warmest Januaries on record going back to the late 1800s. Uh, so quite warm conditions that we see here over the last, um, uh, you know, 30 and, and seven, uh, these are uh, month to date since January. Uh, we can look at the precip as well. So precip uh, of mean. And again, like I said, we were dealing with drought conditions from about October onward, especially in West Central Ohio portions of the Northwest. But as you can see here in the percent of mean over the last 17 days, first 17 days of January, uh, uh, quite a lot of rainfall across Southern Ohio, portions of, of uh, you know, Southern to Northeast Ohio there, a little bit less across the West but enough that we're above average and getting some improving conditions uh, across that region. So again, these are uh, maps that you can do for, you know, looking at a quick snapshot of conditions. Uh, I like often to use this multi-sensor precipitation that you see here over the last, you know, the month to date here, this would be uh, a combination of surface observations and radar-based estimates to kind of fill in those areas where we don't have a lot of uh, station data. Uh, so you can see across southern Ohio, upwards of four to six inches over the last 30 days here, less across northwest and west central, but plenty to help us moisten up that soil uh, there as well. 
Clicking down to these seasonal maps, uh, a lot of useful information here on the seasonal, especially during the growing season. So quick snapshots at the modified growing degree days, for instance, uh, looking out from April and May onward. Uh, snowfall season to date, uh, as you uh, would expect, we are well below average in our snowfall. Although the models are indicating next week, we're going to perhaps catch up a little bit. Uh, at least the potential is there. But if you're looking at accumulated snowfall percent of mean, uh, certainly running about 50, 25, even 10 percent of average uh, to this, this point right now. So if you're interested in that, obviously, you can see a, a lot more of those. Uh, the um, the next thing I want to kind of jump back um, and, and go to another section of this Midwest watch here. If you go under Midwest Climate Watch, agricultural topics, there's a, a whole page dedicated to different ag uh, sources. So, uh, for instance, soil moisture or soil temperature maps across the region. Uh, what you'll notice is that Ohio is not really well represented here. Now we have a series of stations, 10 research stations across the state, but right now that data is not getting into uh, this database. Uh, that's going to be remedied hopefully in the next uh, couple of months here. Uh, so we'll have we'll be able to look at, at soil temperatures here as well for those that are that are interested. Um, clicking down to freeze maps, again, just kind of encouraging you to explore some of this information. You can click on the freeze maps and, and, and look at the dates where we had our first 32 degree freeze this past year through December. So we, we had some early October across southern Ohio and actually later conditions before we got those first freeze across the north. Um, but anyway, if you want to go back and look at some of those, you can as well. And then for those that are interested in um, and probably have seen in the corn newsletter or, or elsewhere, uh, U2U, uh, use, useful to usable tools, in particular, this corn growing degree day tool, um, which uh, is really good during the growing season if you're looking at planting an emergence of corn and then uh, expected black layering. So we can zoom into Ohio, for instance. Pick, a, pick an area here, we can go to Hancock County, create the graph, and of course this is last year's graph. Some of the things that you want to think about, you're, you want to change your growing degree day start here, maybe uh, plant, you can use planting or emergent state, but planted the 15th, maybe you have a 108 day hybrid here, uh, so that's what, what you're using. And what it'll do is it'll chart out the expected growing degree day accumulation, so you've got the annual or kind of the, the range of all years uh, between 1991 and 2020. You've got the purple, which is the average, and then it'll show a prediction for the current year to silking, uh, which can obviously then be use, useful if you're trying to think about that seven to 21 day window and when you might wanna hone in on specific uh, weather variables there, and then even black layer. So uh, really useful tool. Uh, I encourage everyone on here to take a look at that uh, at, on your own uh, time uh, for your management uh, purposes. So uh, that's what I wanted to show you from a climate perspective from the MRCC. Again, each one of these climate webinars, we're gonna dive a little bit more into different data that's available here and some other tools as well. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and, and I will see if there are any questions uh, either regarding the, the climate information or if you've got any last minute questions for Pierce as well. So any questions out there? Aaron, I don't see any in the Q&A. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up unless uh, we'll give it 10 seconds and nope, no more questions here. All right, so I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Pierce, for the great presentation. Uh, we will uh, be sending an email out with a quick survey just to help us with programming and uh, the upcoming uh, uh, webinars that we have in this series as well. Uh, we'll also make this available uh, on our YouTube channel, so look forward to that. Appreciate your attention. Uh, appreciate you being here and uh, have a great rest of your January. And for our snow lovers out there, keep your fingers crossed for next week. Thank you. Thanks.